Thank you, thank you so much. I want to welcome you all to our USF ID Fellows Monday Night Conference. Today is November 10th, 2014. And thank you to Dr. Ayler. Our topic today will be medical and diagnostic mycology of importance to the surgical pathologist. And I have a little uh, subtitle here, Is There a Fungus Among Us? Once again, um, my name is Ramon Sandin. I am at the uh, Moffitt Cancer Center where I've been there forever. Dr. Green and I started the same day, the same day, and we've been there more than we can remember. I'm the Medical Director of Microbiology and Virology, and I'm a senior member in hematopathology and in the Beaumont Transplant Program. Um, I'm very accessible, so I give you their phone, fax, and email, so if you ever have any queries that you feel I can help you with, I'd be more than glad to assist you. Now, if you noticed, the title said, of importance to the, pra to the surgical pathologist. So I felt like I needed to give you the rationale for this presentation to an ID audience. And uh, the story goes like this. I gave a presentation similar to this one not too long ago to the anatomic and surgical pathology department at Moffitt. And in the audience, there was Dr. Ayler, there were other ID attendings, several of the ID pharmas, PharmDs and fellows. And um, I realized that while ID fellows learn the wet lab micro clinical pathology aspects of mycology when you rotate with us, and now that we're doing more play rounds, we do that, you don't get a lot of background on what the other part of pathology, what we call here the dry tissue lab or anatomic pathology section, can do for you in terms of ID diagnosis of mycology. So I felt that a um, 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 similar presentation geared towards you would be very help helpful in terms of alerting you to the kind of information that that part of pathology can give you, particularly if I address both the contributions as well as any diagnostic limitations that occur whenever we only have tissue, and that you will see scenarios where we only have tissue, so micro cannot come in to help make you know clear clear the day, but this plenty that we can tell when only tissue is available. So what are some of those scenarios where we may be stuck with only tissue and where the AP part of pathology will have to come up with diagnosis to help you with your treatment? Number one is the most common one that I see where I work at the Moffitt Cancer Center. Tissue is only submitted to AP because cancer is very much favored in the differential. Number one, cancer. Number two, cancer. Number three, cancer. Number four, maybe infection. So the surgeon just doesn't think about it. Sends it all to pathology, and lo and behold, when we look at slides, there's granulomas there, and there's organisms there that are pretty pathognomonic. Number two happens not infrequently. Tissue is mistakenly placed in formalin in toto. So you're not going to grow anything. The whole thing goes in formalin. We're stuck unless you re-biopsy the patient, there are times when that cannot be done. Number three is a phenomenon that occurs in all of laboratory medicine. Uh, tissue and fluids may be submitted to both parts of the lab, dry and wet, but because of something called sampling error, which means that the agent of interest is represented only in one of the pieces and not in the other, so whichever lab gets that will be able to capitalize on it. The other one will not know. Additionally, in cases of posifungal infections, there's very little fungus there. So it's going to be represented you know, infrequently, so just maybe a piece here and nothing on the other one. In that scenario, you could have that an agent fails to grow out in culture because it wasn't there in the piece we got in micro, but it's clearly present in the tissue section. How about number four? There are agents that simply don't grow in routine synthetic fungal medium. The 37 degree phase of coxy does not grow in blood brain heart infusion at 37, which is what we routinely use for dimorphics. You would need 40 degrees and something called the conversion medium that we just don't carry normally. Rhinus pregnancy, berry, lacasia, lobui, pneumocystis, urobechi don't grow in synthetic media. So we are stuck then with the morphologic aspects in cytology or anatomic pathology for making the call. Number five is not infrequent. 
culture which is very sensitive because there's amplification may grow out several agents from a non-sterile site. Some of those may be normal flora, which is the one that's really authentically causing the disease. Tissue sections, which are very specific, they may not be very sensitive. What you see is what you get. There's no amplification like culture, but they show inflammation around an agent that may be the real one and necrosis. So they may reveal of those several ones the single agent that is ultimately the true one responsible for the pathology. These are just five scenarios. There's many others. Basically, this was just to motivate why we're following today the um, morphologic aspects of mycology in tissue. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do for the next 50 minutes or so. We'll start with a short overview on identifying fungi in tissue. I'll move to a comprehensive list of all of the mycoses. Every fungus you'll ever have to identify and treat will be included in that table. It will make it easy for you to remember. And we're going to break it up into um, the extent of involvement, the types of mycosis according to the extent of involvement of the body. Number three, we'll go into the individual agents. Four, um, most fungi grow well in culture, but I told you that the wet micro is not going to be what's going to be emphasized today. We'll deal with the tissue pathology. Of the two forms of the diamorphic fungi, the 30 and 37, we'll deal today with the tissue form and some of the very rare agent, agents within some of the mycoses that will be covered very briefly. Lastly, and I hope time allows and it only takes three minutes and I'll do this at the end, we're going to go over a diagnostic conundrum that we see very commonly for you as clinicians, for me as a pathologist, and that is in a cancer population practice, is the case an infection or is it a malignancy? It's not that easy to tell early on. These are the two phases of infectious disease pathology in a cancer hospital practice and using two cases from Moffitt at the very end we'll, we'll go over this conundrum. So without further ado, let's start with our quick overview. As you know, fungi are eukaryotes. They have nuclei. Morphologically speaking, we're going to break them down into two groups, the yeasts and the molds. Yeasts are unicellular. They divide by budding, either sexually or asexually, whereas molds are what we call filamentous fungi. They grow by forming very long chains of cells. We call those hyphae. And a mass of hyphae, we call that a mycelium. Some of the very important fungi are what we call dimorphic or diphasic. So that they, means they have two forms or faces and they switch via temperature, so they can be more appropriately called thermodimorphic. One phase is what's called a mycelial or filamentous form. That's a free-living form in nature. We call that the saprophytic form. That's the form we'll breathe in to establish infection. And that's a form that grows at room temperature in the micro lab on a culture plate at 30 degrees. The other form is the yeast yeast-like, we can call it the parasitic phase, which is a phase that we find when the agent is either growing at 37 on a plate, or most important for today's presentation, when it's growing at 37 in our bodies, the best culture plate, meaning the histopathology slides. And these are your seven important, medically important dimorphics. The first four are your four deeper systemics. In terms of endearment are histo, blasto, coxy, and paracoxy. The next two are two of your subcutaneous mycoses, sporo and the agents that are black moles that produce chromoblastomycosis. And the last one is one that may be every once in a while on board, that's penicillium marnefi. It's rare, we hardly ever get it, but it is dimorphic. In the 1990s, it was first discovered in Thailand as a cause of pneumonia in HIV patients, and it was then found that unlike most penicilliums, which are just saprophytes of very little pathogenicity, 
this one can do it, probably because it is dimorphic. It has this um, reddish wine colored pigment that diffuses into the medium. That's Pacillum arnefi, and those are your seven medically important dimorphic fungi. Moving on. According to the body side effect or the extent of involvement, in, to make it easier for you to memorize, we're going to break all mycology into four types. And those are one, the superficial mycosis, two, the subcutaneous mycosis, three, the deeper systemics, and four, the most important one ultimately, to people like me at Moffitt who are so immunocompromised, namely the opportunistic mycosis. Two words on stains, particularly as they apply to tissues, because that's, that's what we're emphasizing today. There are a few stains for fungi that are very useful in histopathology. You will hear two terms, GMS and PAS. GMS stands for Gomori Methanamine Silver Stain. It's a stain that uses silver, throws that stain on the wall of fungi, and they will stain black. Fortunately, if you have a lot of collagen fibers, lots of red cells, they may also take the silver. So that's why as I tell the, the resident, staining pattern and morphology are useful. Not just because it stains black, we're going to say it's a fungus. We've got to make sure that it fits the morphologic aspects of fungi. Likewise, PAS is another very useful fungal stain. It's called periodic acid shift stain. And it also stains the walls. And this one will stain them pink red because it binds to the carbohydrate on the wall, which means that other carbohydrate materials or even small lipids on the smear may take the stain, for which reason staining pattern and morphology both must be used to call it. This is a section in histopathology of a fungus stained with GMS. And this agent has a lot of septations, which are these cross walls. I'm also showing you something that we've learned to love in tissue because it, it is suggestive of an agent. Those are called fungal or hyphal varicosities or ballooning hyphae. They can be seen in many filamentous molds, but Fusarium specifically has it very commonly. Others can have it. So I'm telling you, this is not pathognomonic for Fusarium, but it is very suggestive. And this is in GMS, and this is in PAS. Once again, those ballooning hyphae in the midst of normal hyphae with beautiful cross walls, which we call septations. The other stain that's very useful is musicotamine. There's different permutations, and it stains the capsular polysaccharide of Cryptococcus neoformans, and it's going to stain pink to red. I'll show you pictures now. Unfortunately, we know there's hypocapsular isolates that have very, very little of that capsule. I've even seen some authentically acapsular isolates of cryptoneoformans. And in those cases, there's an another stain that then we recruit called the Fontana Mason stain, which is for melanin, because the only clinically relevant yeast that has a little bit of melanin on the cell wall that we can exploit diagnostically is crypto, and it would stain brown um, with the Fontana Mason. This is a glomerulus in disseminated cryptococcosis. The large capsule has shrunk down and left a halo, and it's opposed onto the yeast cell. And with your music arming, you're going to see it as beautifully, intensely pink to red. In a capsular or very hypocapsular isolate, this is your Fontana Mason, and this is a tiny little wisp of very nice melanin that is present in our crypto that will be picked up by Fontana Mason. H and E, which is a hematoxylin and eosin bread and butter stain in circular pathology, while it will stain most fungi, it stains some very faintly. I find it not to be dependable. The same thing with the tissue gram stains. The brown and brown and brown on hops. They stain most fungi, but sometimes extremely faintly. So when I'm suspicious of anything, I go for our 
you know, faithful ones, GMS and PAS. I personally prefer the GMS, and I just order that. We're done with that. We're going now to the list that has all of your fungi that you need to remember for your practice and boards, broken down conveniently into four types. And they are. And this is your laundry list. Just to mention them, and then we'll go over them for the rest of the presentation. One, deeper systemic mycosis, and there's four. One mostly in South America, the other ones you can see here. Isoplasmosis, blastomycosis, coxidomycosis, and paracoxidomycosis. And we refer to them as histoplasmocoxy and paracoxy. The second one is here, use subcutaneous mycosis that traditionally were five. There are four now, and I'll tell you why. The true fungal mycetoma, or eumycotic mycetoma, the most common one to remember for boards is Pseudoalacheria boidii, the most common cause of eumycotic mycetoma in this hemisphere. Chromoblastomycosis, or chromomycosis, is caused by a whole bunch of agents within the genus Fonsecchia, Phyllophora, and Cladosporium, so the three most common ones, and they're all black molds. Have a lot of melanin. The third one is the Rose Gardner's disease, Sportricosis, by Sportrix Schenkii. You already know it is a dimorphic. Histoblastococci, sporo, chromo, penicillomarnephia, your seven dimorphics. Sporo is also a black mold. We'll see some pictures, so it is a demariaceous agent also. That's three. Those are the least infrequent of your sub-Q mycosis. They're all relatively infrequent. But of the five, if you're going to find any, it's probably one of those three. These two are very much more rare. For rhino, which is the one that's no longer a fungus, it's been found to be a, an aquatic protestant parasite of fish. It's called by, caused by rhinosporidium C. berry. And the last one, lobomycosis, pretty much uh, limited to parts of South America, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, by Lobo Loboi forever, and now called Lacasia Loboi. They want to know how updated you are. It's now Lacasia. I'll give you some names like that as we go, come to them. The third of the four types of mycosis is the cutaneous and superficial one. You've got to remember for your practice three very important ones, which are the ones we'll cover today in the interest of time. And I'll mention briefly a whole bunch of tiny little ones of very little significance other than perhaps cosmetics or if you're a dermatologist or a dermatopathologist. The three to remember are mucocutaneous and cutaneous candidiasis by Candida albicans and the many other species of the genus Candida that are as important because there are, some of them are resistant to diflucan, some of others are resistant to other antifungals. Number two in these superficial mycosis is Tina versicolor by Malassezia furfur. And the last one are the tinias or ringworms, so sorry, known as the dermatophytosis by species within three genera, microsporum, epidermophytum, and trichophytum. The little ones that I'm not going to cover other than just mention them here are the Tinea nigra palmaris or Plantaris, which in my lifetime has changed names four times. It is called now Hortaya Wernicke for your boards. At one point it was called Cladosporum Wernicke, then Exophyella Wernicke, then Phaeonelomyces Wernicke, now Hortaya Wernicke, just to keep the taxonomists employed. Piedra, or stone in Latin and Spanish, a little concretion, could be light colored white piedra or dark black piedra. Those are little concretions in the hair of real, little uh, clinical relevance, and they can be gotten rid of by just clipping the hair. White piedra is called by Trochosporum begillii, black piedra by Piedra horti. And included here are other miscellaneous and even more rare mycosis and even some achlorophyllous algae such as Protheca are thrown in there for lack of a better place. And the last of your four mycoses that you're going to remember to place all your fungi there are the most important, the opportunistic ones, the ones that will not hurt you unless 
your patient if you immunocompromise. There are four of those. The first one, cryptococcosis, up to now, up to the last few years, pretty much by cryptococcus neoformans. But of course, we know there's that emerging pathogen, cryptococcus gatti, that is gaining tremendous importance in the U.S. We've had two cases of Moffitt in the last year and a half. Two and three of your opportunistic mycoses are the filamentous molds that are so frequent, have hundreds of species and genera. The first one is your light colored filamentous molds, high yellow, high formicids. You can remember as pergillus as your prototype, and then all the other hundreds of cousins, genus, genera, and then species of them. Fail hyphomyces are the black or dark or melanin containing filamentous molds and there's really hundreds of genera there and I'll cover a few more momentarily. And the last one is zygomycosis, the zygomycetous fungi that we see so commonly in brittle diabetics and other immunocompromised patients by rhizopus mucorepsidia Board question, Leictemia is the new name, L-E-I-C-H-T-E-I-M-I-A, Leictemia, it switched two years ago. So Obsidia, we'll call it Obsidia because how we remember it, but it's Leictemia and these other two, the more common ones, but there's about 10 other genera that every once in a while rarely we see. We're done with your table. Every fungus that I'm going to talk about, you never need to classify is in that table. So now for the rest of the presentation, we'll take the more important agents and we'll go over their infectious pathology. Let's start with the deeper systemic mycosis, which are those four there. Let's start with histo. Histo <coughs> is present in the guano and debris from birds and bats. It doesn't kill the bats, but it grows very nicely in the nitrogenous material. So you can imagine if you're a spelunker in caves and there's mountains of bad guano, you're going to be breathing that in and you can get, in fact, very, very sick as has happened with groups of spelunkers in Kentucky that have gone on in expeditions. What's great about histo and all four deeper systemics is that the great majority of people who inhale it only have an inapparent or a subclinical or a flu-like syndrome. It is only a minority that it moves on to produce either a chronic pulmonary condition, mucocutaneous or rarely a more systemic. Even more rarely you can have an acute fulminating one, and I've seen a couple of those, and they have been all in children. This is disseminated histo to the tongue and to the skin of the lip. We're emphasizing only the tissue phase of all of these guys. So histo at 37 degrees in tissue produces something that is very much pathognomonic. Tiny, tiny little budding yeasts, two to four microns, that have this very narrow neck to between mother and daughter yeast. The only thing that looks like it size-wise in your differential is a short differential. Malassezia furfur, which doesn't cause anything similar to the clinical pictures we would see with histo, and as we'll see momentarily, it has a broad base between mother and daughter yeast. Histo, two to four microns, thin neck. The other one is that penicillin marnefi that I had mentioned, extremely rare. I've been 20 years at Moffitt. Clinically, I have never had a single patient. We get it in CAP surveys for proficiency testing in the laboratory never had an actual patient. That one is almost size-wise like is so two to five and it has a relatively uh, thin attachment but it has other differences. And there's a little parasite that I'll ask you about momentarily that fits the description of being two to four uh, and being present in potentially cells of the reticulo endothelial system. So keep that in your mind's eye because that's very, very much pathognomonic. Now, where I work, <coughs> we see very few acute histoplasmosis. We see plenty of granulomas in tissue. 
what we call all histoplasmomas, which is a cooling lesion in an elderly patient in an x-ray, and they need to rule in or rule out neoplasia, send them to Moffitt, the weight resection, rollobectomy, lo and behold, in the midst of fibrosis and caseation or fibrosis and calcification, we see these little yeasts that are dead or dying because I can tell you in 20 years I always get a piece in micro if I don't get one I go get it myself and we have never grown out histo from, a, from a, a histoplasmoma that tells you that these things have been there for a long long time and they're pretty much dead or dying not so in acute disease and they're gonna consult ID big time in acute disease, something hasn't been on there in the lung for ages, these things are going to be within the reticular and the thelial system cells. So, lymphocytes and monocytes in the peripheral blood, um, lymph nodes, spleen, liver, that's where you're going to see them. And there they're going to be intracellular with the morphology that I showed you inside the granulomas also, two to four microns with a thin neck between mother and daughter yeast. These are all histoplasmomas. They are extremely calcified. That's one of the giveaways, grossly. But so are several others of the deeper systemics that produce the omas, the tumors, also at the end. So this grossly doesn't give itself away. I'm just telling you that once we see what we see, you go back and yeah, most of these have a lot of calcium. In acute disease, this is a touch prep from bone marrow. There's a whole collection of these tiny little yeasts there. And this was a patient when I was at years ago at a Cleveland Clinic with a peripheral blood monocyte loaded with these small little yeasts. And that grew beautifully. It's acute disease in that, you know, higher river valley. We don't get those here. We get pretty much the OMA, the histoplasmoma. Question for you. This is the GMS stain and shows the uh, brown to black yeasts. And I'm giving and tell you that there were three lookalikes in terms of size, Pesio Marnefi, Malassezia, and then this yeast, th th this entity. And this is a non fungus, a lookalike to histone tissue, is intracellular, two to five, reticular endothelial system cells, but it has something called this little thing here. And that little there, every nucleus has there, that little bar, that's called a kinetoplast, is a remnant of a flagellum that never developed because these bodies are what we call an amastigote, amastiga, no mastiga, which in Latin means whip, no whip, no flagellum. It's the, it's the only stage of this agent, it's a stage where there's no flagellum. And it would not grow on fungal mediums, not a fungus, stains with gimsa, as do all parasites won't stain with GMS. Any ideas of what that is? That's it. That's a poor question right there. That's Leishmania. The other look alike morphologically. I must move on to the second of your four deeper systemics. That's blasto. Blasto, you're going to remember the eastern third. Coxie will be the western when we get to it. How do we catch all the deep or systemic fungal pathogens? You breathe in the filamentous form in nature. It goes into your nose, sinuses, lung. If it's going to disseminate, it goes from there. So we know from blasto that the primary disease is going to be pulmonary. I'll give you a clinical clue. The stage in the lung of blasto, unlike the other three, is so ephemeral that you can go and do a CT to look for a focus in the lung and not find it. And by then, it's done this. This was up in Cleveland. This patient had this lesion, and this is a blow up. It looks like a carcinoma or a, a bad seborrhea. This is a very verrucous disseminated lesion of blasto. And the uh, CTs in lung were clean. Went to the books, the books, particularly the big Bible of mycology was and forever will be Dr. Ripon. He's 99 and he lives in Safety Harbor now. Um, he told us from the very beginning that that stage is so quick that you may not have it and you know you have blasto by the skin lesion. So it is very dermatotropic and it can affect bone also. 
this was one of the pictures in his old book, it's the original, um, the first version of someone in the South in the 1920s with disseminated blastomycosis. Blastoma 37 in tissues or in culture, because it would be the thermodimorphic, same morphology. Totally different from it's so worth memorizing. Pathognomonic, nothing looks like this in infectious diseases. Very large mother yeast. I'm going to give you, instead of ranges, which are hard to remember, I'm going to just going to give you a pearl. I gave you two to five for histo. I'm going to give you 16 for blasto. Very large, huge. And it has these thick, what they call double contoured walls with a very large broad based bud. There we go. Blasto at 37 in tissue or growing from the plate also. This very large mother yeast, 16 microns, with a very thick double contoured wall. And look at this very broad, broad based, but in between mother and daughter yeast. And look at this. Differential diagnosis size wise and morphology wise, zero. This cannot be confused with anything else in infectious disease pathology. Put that in your mind's eye right now. The third of the four deeper systemics is Coxy. Coxy, remember, is the far west. San Joaquin Valley, Mexico, Nevada, California, all those states there, southwest. It's present in the desert, so when there's a storm, you can be going through the desert with uh, you know the windows down, and you can be breathing in a huge amount of Coxy. And what happens there that the majority of people get a primary infection, which is just like a little flu-like syndrome, and they call it valley fever. It could be fever and that's it. Or rarely even the fever or flu-like syndrome. Like I mentioned with all of these, a minority can do major damage. Dissemination or systemic disease. And when it does, just like blasto and its cousin in the south, South American blasto, those three are very dermatotropic, and in the meantime, they mess up the bone that's involved also. What do I see in my practice? We have never had an acute coxie, I'm off it. We have plenty of coxidioidomas, similar to the histoplasmomas that I mentioned, those coin lesions that person comes into rule in, rule out cancer. I'll tell you more about that. This is disseminated coxie to the uh, lesion in the skin and bone of the wrist and a lytic bone lesion in the phalange. Coxia 37, pathognomonic, if you see a little star or this little bell, you got to memorize that because nothing else will look like it. This is what you see for the boys. Thick wall spherules, 50 microns is what you're going to remember. 2 to 5 microns histo, 16 blasto, 50 Coxie spheral, huge, with many endospores. And in acute lesions, which we've had at Tampa General, and I have pictures to show you of pneumonitis, you will see all stages of development of those uh, spherules. I only see this amorphic coxidoidomas, so I will only see either fragmented old spherules, sometimes empty spherial walls, I may see a cluster of endospores that no longer have a spherial wall in the midst of a fibro fibrosis and caseation or fibrosis and calcification, what we call the coxidoidomas. For your boards, there's only one real differential diagnostic agent in tissue for coxie, and that's rhino, which is no longer a fungus, but I will perpetually include it in my lectures on mycology because it's the one big lookalike to coxie in tissue. It has spherules with endospores. For you to remember, is this. It's four times as large. It's really huge. 200 microns. And those endospores can stain with mesocarmine as pink to red. And I'll show you pictures of that, that momentarily. This was a Tampa General. The guy was 17. He was HIV positive, a Filipino. Descendant. This was about 12, 15 years ago. And I asked the pathology resident, send me pictures. And he said, Dr. Sandin, this is what we got. He came from Phoenix, where his family was. He went there, came back with a rampant pneumonitis. And he was bronchoscope, and he 
used to micro and piece of pathology and the pathology is showing you gorgeous spherules at all stages of development up to this one that is loaded with endospores ready to break and uh, they saw that and alerted micro and everything went under the hood and every pit was sealed they eventually got what I'm not covering with you today the 30 degree phase the fluffy white beautiful mold that is exceedingly infectious for which reason we don't sniff molds in microbiology that's done under the hood so that confirmed it this was an acute case of coxie which then prompted him to move from just HIV to AIDS this is what I see actually which is asymptomatic old most patients old patients old lesion old coxidoidomas we're in the midst of all this caseation and fibrosis you see these broken up spherules and these chunks of endospores with no spherule wall that's a giveaway and rhino which used to be right one of those five subcutaneous mycoses that produce sessile pedunculated polyps in the nose or eye this is one of those spherules that they call sporangia they're huge you can see them with your with your naked eye spherules with endospores but these endospores stain beautifully with music carmine they stain pink to red so easy to tell this one then not only size wise but because of that from coxie the last one very briefly is paracoxy the fourth and last of your deeps south american blastomycosis it disseminates and it loves mucocutaneous and lymphangitic areas and destruction of an uvula this was in Belo Horizonte in Brazil we saw plenty of patients there with leishmaniasis and in this case disseminated paracoxidoidomycosis which are clinically very hard to tell in this case it had a horrible very inflammatory reaction by paracoxy by biopsy and by culture this one is totally pathognomonic nothing looks like this ever in your practice or mine large mother yeasts with many daughter yeasts connected by a narrow neck we call that the mariner's wheel pilot's wheel or ship's steering wheel and you see it right there nothing looks like this in infectious disease and that is a huge mother 16 microns average could up to 50 with as many as 20 little children attached by a very thin neck okay differential diagnosis size and morphology wise zero nothing there's no way to confuse this we're done with the deep and systemics let's go with the other three of the four types of mycosis I mentioned these are all rare but the first three are less rare to ones I'll cover today mycetoma mycetoma was first observed in India years ago in a district called Madura so it became known as Madura foot or Madura mycosis consists of a clinical trilogy of a swelling extremity usually a foot but it could be an arm like in this guy from Ecuador who was hauling hay constantly and getting poked draining sinuses right here and there's going to be granules that drain through those sinuses of various colors containing the agent if you catch the deep and systemic fungal pathogens by breathing in the filamentous form in nature you catch all of your sub-Q mycoses by this traumatic implantation of a soil saprophyte or a plant pathogen by a thorn into your skin two types of mycetoma for your practice are actinomycotic and eumycotic the more common in the world is actinomycotic is members of the actinomycetales which are the filamentous branching higher bacteria that include most importantly nocardia streptomyces actinomadura and actinomyces dianerobe there we go the minority of mycetomas are called true fungal or eumycotic mycetoma they're not always but most cases are caused by black molds of multiple genera and species the one you're going to remember is the most common in this part of the world that's Sulalashira boidia the granules will have either true hyphae 
if they're eumycotic or they'll be containing just the bacterial filaments if they're actinomycotic. This is a granule crushed, the ones that comes out through those sinuses, and it has these large hyphae, seven microns in width, because it's true fungal. We would only know what grows, we would only know what causes it if we can grow it. The other one is actinomycotic mycetoma. What it has is these clusters of these branching bacteria, filamentous branching, and if the agent causing it is actinomyces, the genus, this is what you're going to see. This is a low power view, and a high power view shows these radiating fingers or thimbles or rays that they call the splendor-hopley phenomenon or the asteroid body, these things on the outside. When these actinomyces granules were discovered 100 years ago without a stain, they were yellow. So that's why they call them sulfur granules, because the element sulfur is yellow when unstained. Nocardia, one of the more common causes of actinomycotic mycetoma, produces these, again, filamentous, branching, beaded, in gram stain of filaments. We have a stain called the nocardia stain, which allows it to come out as a red snapper. In tissue, it's called a phyte or phyte foraco. It has the morphology of a nocardia, filamentous, very long, branching, and then red. This stain allows very weakly acid-fast agents, such as these two, nocardia and mycobacterium lepra, to come out as acid-fast. If I use the common acid-fast bacillus stain, they would lose the carbofuxin by the decolorizer. They're weakly acid-fast, but with the weaker decolorizer of the nocardia stain, known as a phyte stain, they remain red. The second of your subcumycosis is chroma. And chroma produces these very ugly verrucous or cauliflower-like lesions. And it's produced by black or dematiaceous molds. Again, soil saprophytes via an abrasion. There's many species that can cause chromo, mostly within the genus Fonsecchia, Cladosporium, and Phylophora. What I'm covering today is what happens to this. Remember, it's one of your seven dimorphics. Histoblasto, coxiparacoxy, chromo, sporo, penicillium, marnef, it switches at 37 from the fruiting body on our plates to what we see in tissue, and that is sclerotic bodies, copper pennies, or medlar bodies. And I'll show you now, these are very large cells that are brown, because these are black molds, and they divide very irregularly and produce different subcells. This is a beautiful copper penny. This is a very planate or irregular cell division, giving you three cells that are of uneven size. You will never forget it because we have a walking penny copper pennies. The third of these three less infrequent of our rather infrequent subcumycosis is sporo, or what we call the Rose Garner disease. Cutaneous inoculation because of an injury with a thorn from a rose plant or any, that upon giving you a primary lesion like here, can then spread and produce a bubo more proximal original lesion and then bubo, and then that goes along the lymphatics and may at times produce a very inflammatory disease, lymphocutaneous sporotrichosis, not unlike the very inflammatory cases of lymphocutaneous nocardiosis. Rarely, I've only seen one in my life, can that go to bone or lung or even disseminated. Most times it remains as what it is, a subcumycosis. It is a dimorphic. We know that it's a black mold, hematiaceous, and at 37, what we will see is this. Remember this cigar. These are called cigar bodies. They're going to be very, very thin, very, very long yeasts, as long as 10 microns. And in the tissues, I tell the pathology residents, 
just like what we saw with Actino, the genus, this one also tends to promote an asteroid body. This Splendor Hopley phenomenon. And these are the very long, very thin, pencil thin cigar body yeasts of Spora 37. The other ones were Rhino, which we covered as your differential of coccin tissue, and Lobo, which is natures of time I am going to sacrifice. Moving on to the third of your four mycosis, and that's your cutaneous or superficial. Remember, there's three important agents there Candida, the agent of Tinea versicolor, and the agents of the Trutinia's ringworms. Let's start with Candida. Candida of everything we'll cover today, everything that we cover today comes from outside. You breathe it in, you get inoculated, what have you. There's one agent that comes from inside is endogenous, and that is Candida is a member of the indigenous microbiota of a GI, a GU tract, and skin. We get it when we're born, either vaginally from our, to my, our mother, or even if you're born by C-section from the skin of the caretakers. And you get colonized. Everybody has an element of Candida in a GI tract. But it can go beyond that in immunocompromise and produce things such as thrush, we've seen plenty of those, diaper rash, onychomycosis for your boss, remember thick fungi, fusarium, the most common cause of toe and toenail infection in cancer patients, candida can give you paranechia onychomycosis, and the third one, the one we'll cover soon, the dermatophytes. And this is rare, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, a type of chronic granulomatous disease where it's an aberration immunologically. They produce these horns, those granulomas, but they just cannot eat the candida away, and those kids have major issues. Morphologically, albicans is still the most prevalent species worldwide. We know that Glabrata, Crucii, and Tropicalis are very much resistant to Diflucan. And they have become major foes, as have others that have developed resistance to some other antifungals. Now, morphologically, the books tell you that candida is a yeast. But I'm here to tell you that, technically, candida can give you three phases. Because it's really triphasic. The yeast, seven microns. But it can give you something called pseudohypha, this sausage link, right here with these little pinchings. And it can give you more rarely a hypha, this one, which is a lot more narrow than thinner than our mold hyphae, very much less frequent than the pseudohyphae, and there's no pinching like pseudohyphae. And there's not no 45 degree angulate bifurcations like we see in Aspergillus, for example. When candida, which can be normal flora in a tissue, is going beyond being normal flora, when it's invasive or just non saprophytic, we will usually see two of the three phases or all three. You'll see your pseudohyphae and your budding yeast, plus or minus hyphae. If all we see is just yeasts, we usually think that's a passerby. Okay? It's a piggybacking on whatever is there. And rarely in that case is there infl any inflammation around it that would have shown that it was authentically the cause of illness. This is your pinching. This is your sausage links. And these are your budding yeasts. This is the more rare hypha that we can tell very easily pathologically from aspergillus because it's a lot thinner, three or four microns in width instead of the more larger seven microns in width. The second of your three important superficial ones is the entity that we know as Tinea versicolor caused by the agent known as Malassezia furfur. Tinea versicolor, you have it right here, which is macules, papules, patches, and plaques that could be hypo or hyperpigmented depending on your underlying pigmentation. Beyond Tinea versicolor, we know that Malassezia can do at least three more things. Can be just normal skin flora not producing Tinea versicolor or any pathology. But when it, can, when it wants to do damage under very strict scenarios, it can. It can produce fungemia and death in a patient 
particularly those who are on IV intralipid therapy through a central catheter. And rarely can produce folliculitis in BMT patients during the neutropenia, which doesn't happen pretty much at all at Moffitt because these patients are all prophylaxed. This is my first autopsy ever as a first year pathology resident, July 1st. And lo and behold, this baby who was seven months old, preemie, is dying at about 28 days of life. And they don't know what is there. And there were three other babies in the NICU that were getting sick. He has a central catheter. He is getting intralipid. And then we do a frozen section from a piece straight from the autopsy. And we see that every large vessel in the body is chock full of these tiny two to four micron yeast. By then, I knew no pathology, but I knew my micro. I was a microbiologist by then. And I said, let's measure this. It was three microns. And it had a broad base between mother and daughter yeast. So this is malassezia. Let's go to the micro lab. This shouldn't be growing. We went to the micro lab. There was nothing growing. You would expect that. It is a lipophilic yeast. requires olive oil to make medium to long chain fatty acids. Olive oil was added. The, the same place where we strict. Place back in the, in the incubator. Within a day or two, those things was loaded. But we couldn't have known that. Because until this, what is it suspected? This is a lady with folliculitis and Moffitt. And I may have more to show you. But you don't see that hardly ever. Malassezia is a yeast technically, and it is a very tiny one. For your boards in the one specific clinical manifestation that we call tinea versicolor, which is a superficial manifestation, and only in tinea versicolor, you're going to see this. Not yeast only, but spaghetti and meatballs. This is your spaghetti and meatballs here to put into your mind's eye. What are those? The yeasts in the mist of these short, stubby, little truncated, high fever each pieces of them with a very blunt end. Those are you, those are your spaghettis and your meatballs. And those we will see in a scraping of the university color. But in disseminated disease, like this baby, all you'll see is your little yeast and that's it. The third and last of the important superficial ones are the dermatophytes or tinnies. The ringworms, they love keratin, hair, skin, and nails. It's called ringworm fungi. Species within three genera, micro, spermepidermo, phyton, trichophyton. We identify them in the wet lab. I'm not going into that today. It is usually a clinical diagnosis that you make. If you need help, a KOH scraping, and I'll show you, will show it. Or a tissue biopsy will show it, and it can grow it also. It is named by the geographic body location as tinea fasciale with the serpiginous border here that is itchy and scaly and would have the bug there, tinea unguium and tinea pedis, tinea chorus, and, and so on. Pathologically in skin, if all we have is a KOH smear or a biopsy, this is all we would see, septated hyphae. And they may not be breaking up into small pieces called arthroconidia. 
and if hair is what we need to look at, we can look under the microscope, and these hyphae breaking up into arthrocanidia can be inside the hair. Endotrix, this is an endotrix infection. These are rows of canidia breaking up into these square or rectangular arthro-jointed, arthro canidia that make up the hypha. In hair, you could have it also in the outside. There would be ectotrix hair invasion. I'm done with that. Moving on to the last of your four types of mycosis, your opportunistic mycosis, clearly by far the most important for my practice and probably for yours. And those are four, cryptococcosis, hyaluronphal hyphomycosis, and the zygomycetes fungi. Let's start with crypto. Cryptococcosis is uh, caused by a yeast associated with pigeon droppings, chicken or turkey droppings. And it loves to disseminate very quickly. Remember, all of these patients are going to be debilitated. And when it does, it loves to go to CNS and skin. This lady had a double whammy. She was a pill diabetic with uh, terminal uh, lymphoma. And these were ugly skin lesions by crypto. This is one of our patients with disseminated crypto at Moffitt. This is from a book in subacute or chronic meningitis. Very, very slimy subdural or epidural material because of all of those polysaccharide capsules that I'll show you. Causing immunocompromise in this case as in all the agents that produce opportunistic disease. This is what you're going to remember morphologically. This is a yeast. It's a budding yeast. This guy is monomorphic. It has no filamentation. I've seen that twice in my entire life. Been doing this for a quarter century. Rarely is there filamentation. Just monomorphic. And I'll show you what it looks like. What do we do see is this huge variability in size. 2 to 20 microns. And huge variability in shape. And I'm going to show that too. And they have this beautiful polysaccharide capsule that we can then highlight with a musicarmine. And mother and daughter are held by a narrow threat, as was the case with paracoxy. We use a lot musicarmine to help us. And you'll get a red coloration because of the capsule. Rarely you'll have hypocapsular or acapsular strains that have this huge variability in size and shape. I'm thinking, this is crypto. It's not coming up with the music army. So let's go to the second line of attack. Let's do a Fontana Mason. And that will stain the small amount of melanin that is present in the crypto cell wall, not the capsule. So it's a stain that is capsule independent. Even if your organism has very little capsule, the Fontana Mason will come in and save the day. This is a very slimy mucousy colony that may run down the plate or the slant because it uh, has so much uh, polysaccharide capsule at the individual level. And this is a yeast with a huge capsule highlighted by nigrazine or India ink. This is the nigrazine here. And this is a huge capsule. This is your yeast. And this is disseminated crypto in our hospital. This is the glomerulus again. This guy had hundreds of yeast and with the EMS you can see that all of that capsule shrinks. It opposes itself onto the body of the organism and leaving all of these halos there. This is GMS and this is with the music calming. In the very rare eight capsule or hypercapsular uh, isolates, we can then again go to this stain that I had shown you from Tanamason that has this thin rim of melanin in the wall. So who cares if there's no capsule? The wall is the one that has the thin rim of melanin and that would save the day. Two and three of your four opportunists are the very frequent filamentous molds that come in two types, the hyalo hyphomycetes or light colored hyaline filamentous fungi and the phao hyphomycetes, filming in black or demariaceous filamentous fungi. Let's do two of these four. Hyalo, hyphomycetes. These are all free living saprophytes in nature and we'll put them in or rarely we can get them stuck into our skin also. 
They can produce the entire spectrum of disease. They produce high feed that are well septated. That means they have many, many, many cross, cross walls. And they love to branch at 45 degree bifurcations. This is a bifurcation right here. This is another bifurcation right here. The prototype for you to remember is Aspergillus, but it has many cousins, such as Penicillium, Fusarium, Pycillomyces, and at least a hundred other genera. This is Aspergillus terius with his rows of Canidia on the plate. This is on the plate, this is a fruiting body, and this is Aspergillus fumigatus with a thinner. Um, base to the vesicle. As I tell the pathology residents, and it's more that you know it because you're going to have the patient in front of you, and a path resident first year, sometimes they still are very impulsive and they make mistakes. And I tell them, word of caution, there's no sure way to distinguish aspergillosis on histology alone from all the other ones that produce high feet that are well septated, unless in the tissue, there's an air-containing space that has allowed the fruiting body of the agent to sprout, and then it's almost like you were looking at the plate with the fruiting body. Those are rare, but we have seen them. This is tissue. This is not a plate. And you're seeing here what looks like a vesicle with the very early rows of canidia from a vesicle and a more narrow canidia 4 cut through. So on your HNE slide, this is your first panel. Fruiting body formation in tissues, while rare, usually we see it in lungs, you can tell that an air-containing space is there, such as it's an emphysema cavity or the evacuated center of a tumor. It allowed air to come in. Fungus is there and it's sprouting a mycelium, like on a plate. In this case, it's okay to go this far in tissue, no further. Flash shake vesicles are present with early rows of canidia, which is consistent with aspergillus. I will need cultural confirmation for definitive identification to the species level. If there is no fruiting body, and all there is is basically regular size separated hyphae with the bifurcations, it's safest only to say, quote, septated hyphae are present, consistent with a filamentous mold, generic, don't even go into genus or species, await cultural confirmation and let the micro lab call it when it grows because we'll have fruiting bodies. It's going to be very, very easy to tell. The third of these four types of opportunities are the black molds. They're free living in nature. They can produce the entire spectrum of disease. And this is your pearl. They're pigmented. They're brown to black, both grossly, as the case here, we see the sporans prolificans inflatum, and microscopically as alternaria, the little hand grenades. So they're black, brown to black because they have a melanin-like pigmentation. It is important for the residents to remember what I just told them and admonish them because in tissue, tissue sections, these guys produce septated hyphae, septated, well, bifurcations, that may bifurcate at 45, similar in shape to the high yellow hyphomycetes. And if it's one of the black molds with very little melanin-like pigmentation on tissue, they will not look pigmented. They look pigmented on the plate because we have millions of them growing together. It's easy to see the pigment there. But when they only have a tissue to call it, and it's one of the ones that are very weakly pigmented, you may not know. Maybe a fair hyphomycetes or one of the high yellow hyphomycetes, or it could be aspergillus, and all you see is septated hyphae that may bifurcate. Now, some of the more common ones I will see in practice are alternaria, this one, with your hand grenades. This is all fruiting body in on the plate. Curvularia, the only curved black mold that has these huge canidia that are thick walled and multicellular. So the Sheria Boidia here, pear shaped canidia, piriform canidia on the plate, and a bad player for us. And Dr. Green finds out that we're growing Cirrusborn prolificans. You should go inflate them, that's not a good thing. This guy here, and this guy here on the plate, very pitch black, a 
within a few days because it tends to be very resistant. As was the case with this young woman, she had a double whammy. She had disseminated breast cancer and they had disseminated pseudospiriasis. She had a brain infarct at autopsy, spleen infarct, this huge hemorrhagic kidney infarct. And then microscopically the PMS, PAS stain shows the dissemination to the glomerulus. Where you see the yeast, the conidia here and the hyphal forms. It's a shame. She was 39. One last <coughs> slide on the black mold. Important to know. Not all pheohyphomycetes are identical. Some are very pitch black. Would be super pitch black on the plate. So much so that at the individual hyphal level, we can even tell they have pigments. Others are, as I mentioned, so weakly pigmented on the plate, you would never see them pigmented on an H&E. So, today we're talking about cases where you don't have the lab to help us. How much can we go? How far? In terms of a black mold. If you do not have culture available to help you make a call, ferrohyphomycosis as a tissue diagnosis may still be possible on H&E. If the agent is very demariaceous, and it would produce then at the individual hyphal level, witness this guy, this is H&E, it would individual hyphal level, this wine red, brownish, or black coloration. I was shown this in a review slide, and I said, I said, fail hyphomycosis. You would never see that on an H&E, unless it brings its own innate pigmentation there. The, the, this was a lady, this was a nun. This was the case of the naked nun, is how we remember it. This was a nun in St. Petersburg in a convent, and they have a beautiful backyard. And it's huge walls and a lot of trees. And she did her gardening in the nude. She had to accept it. And there's nobody looking. So that was the problem. The problem is that she had had malignant melanoma in the inguinal area years before and saved herself. And she got stuck in the same area by a thorn that introduced a black mold and produced clinically. This is how she presented to the idea that at St. Anthony's here as this inguinal lesion before treatment. Biopsy was done. It was sent to USF for uh, some sort of review. I looked at it and I said, that's a black mold. The ID term and USF uh, group treated her with itraconazole back then. Beautiful. And there's another picture. I don't have it with me. Two or three weeks later, ooh, it had shrunk completely. It did the trick. It did the trick. So this clearly was a black mold that we can't prove what it was because it was never cultured. It was all sent placed in formalin and all we had to go by. But thankfully, it gave itself away because of the huge amounts of pigment. I'm done with the third and I'm coming to the fourth and last of your four types of mycosis. Remember, deep or systemic, superficial, subcutaneous, and now we're on the fourth of your opportunists, crypto, Hyalo, and Pheohypho, and now the Zygomycetos fungi within the order of Mucralis. These guys, again, like some of the others, are free living or sacrificing decaying vegetation. One syndrome that we are particularly afraid of is rhinocerebral mucomycosis in brittle diabetics, but we see it rarely, but we see it at Moffitt, even in people who are not uh, in diabetic ketoacidosis. This is from my book. This is starting to produce gangrene around the nose, and eight, bu eight hours later, in that book, it tell me, tells me that this is eight hours later, how it has gangrenized the tissue and gone into the nose, and down into the palate, and possibly through the cribriform plate into the brain. Pathologically, we look for these broad, hyposeptated, very few cross walls that are ribbon-like, very regular. They look like runes, they fall onto themselves. And they may appear like what's called a moose antler. This is a moose, these are moose antlers. It may look even like this, or like empty tubes. Like all pathology, you've got to use your imagination. The hyphae may be difficult to see on H&E. 
They may even stain lightly with the silver stains. This was a lovely lady in our hospital. She was a diabetic and she had a neoplasia and I'm trying to remember what it was a disseminated one. She was found to have culture and biopsy proven involvement of the left cheek and her family really wanted to save her. And they agreed with surgery to do this, a left orbital exenteration, prophylactically, to try to save her. And in fact, this is the eye in pathology or the soft tissue in pathology. We got the tissue sections show, as expected, the broad, ribbon-like, hyposeptated, moose antler-like hyphae. We found that all over, but not on the actual optic nerve. So we thought, hopefully, it's not there, which can then take it up to the brain. We'll see. She was packed very soon thereafter. She started convulsing. She was taken back in. This is her. A couple of weeks later, she's being prepped. Craniotomy with sampling and pathology. Here we are in the midst of a multinuclear giant. So you see cross sections and longitudinal sections of your hyposeptated ribbon-like hyphae. So it did make it to the brain. Rarely will you see this. So I took a picture, one little hypha with two cross walls. These are hyposeptated. Rarely will you see two. They're not aseptated like in the old books. They can have them, but they're never, ever as regular as in an aspergillus or one of the hyalo or pheohyphomycetes. And they don't branch at 45. Okay, they branch, if anything, at 90, and they tend to be very regular. So she was clipped. She was deceased uh, soon thereafter, and this thing grows overnight. The mucoralis, we shrink, seal those plates, as you'll see. When you go to mind, we have a, it's like a tape that's wet, and when it dries, it shrinks, and it seals the plates called shrink seal. Otherwise, the next morning, you know, the lids will be up on your incubator. That's how quickly these things grow. The nomenclature for the mucoralis is this. It's, it's called a sporangium with sporangiospores held by a sporangiophore. Aspergillus would be a conidiophore with conidia or conidiospores. Go figure. I'll conclude the last two minutes of my presentation. As I mentioned originally, the, the two phases of infectious is pathology practice in a cancer hospital, and that is, is it a case of inf an infection or is it a malignancy? It's not easy to tell all the time. We're going to cover this briefly with two cases. The first one, a cancer that looked clinically like an infection. Both had presentation, but was shown to be cancer by pathology. The second one is an infection of the lung chronic that presented as a solitary nodule or coin lesion may resemble can, uh, cancer lesions clinically or radiologically, which force the patient to undergo a thoracotomy in the OR to rule out malignancy. We get tissue, and the lesion was shown to be microbial in origin. Let's start with the first one. We're going to call it the finger lesion. 79-year-old male patient, history of colon cancer and prostate cancer. Presented with a four-week history of painless swelling of the distal aspect of the left index finger. Denied trauma, ID, and hemonc were consulted. This is what we saw, an inflamed phalange with an ugly-looking onychomycosis, paronychia, could be. It could be so many other things. We see nocardia, mycobacteria, morphe, it could be a felon. So clinically, in the debilitated, a very elderly patient with history of cancer, a first impression from such a lesion logically could favor that it's probably an infection. And it could be many things. And you could expand on this list. Um, my limited lists of, uh, would include things like oligomycosis or paronychia, fungal infections, a felon by staph as a sub-Q infection, the mycobacteria, particularly the rapid growers, Fortuncelloni abscessus with the fish tank granuloma marinum. Nocardia, we've seen that. Brasiliensis asteroides, several of the new species also. Sportricosis, pseudomonas, amongst other gram negatives. Herpetic wiglow, even some of the Iclerophilus algae like Prototheca have been 
published to, to produce lesions like this rarely. And the, the, land, the, you know, the list could go on. But this is what we saw here. The x-ray of the finger and an in-depth HMP because of the history of colon cancer and prostate cancer showed the following. The labs and blood markers were ordered. The x-ray showed destruction of the phalanx by a pathologic fracture at the base. Surgery amputated the distal phalanx. Cultures were all negative. The pathology was diagnostic. That's your pathology. Which of the bugs in that list is the cause of this pathology? No bug. This is adenocarcinoma mucinous consistent with a colonic primary, metastatic to finger. Serum CEA levels increased threefold in as little as nine months, 4.2 to 12.7, and clinically, um, the conclusion was this patient died six months later from progression of the malignancy and the impression, colon cancer metastatic to finger and you pearl, not all that looks infectious in a cancer patient turns out to be of an infectious nature. Metastasis to hands do occur. So with the ID fellow that was with us at the time, we published a paper, Dr. Green and I, we love to publish. <laughs> and you guys are tremendous because you're eager and you know, everybody uh, benefits because then we can use it for teaching. And we found with the help of that fellow that metastasis to hands are rare. And that was a, a full review. 0.1% of all metastases go to the hands. It may resemble more commonly an infectious process. He looked and saw 168 cases in the world literature. In many of them, recent trauma to the digit was very frequently reported. And we couldn't understand why um, someone in biochemistry mentioned that um, if that precedes localization of the metastasis to the finger, it could be by increased blood flow from the trauma or release of chemotactic factors that allows that to then settle in there. I really don't know. But we know clinically that infectious causes of digits and toes are by far a lot more frequent than neoplastic causes of metastatic disease there. The last case is the second painless. Hmm? Painful, yeah, correct. The other side of the coin is a lesion that resembles cancer clinically or radiologically but turn out to be of an infectious nature by pathology or microbiology. This one is called the pulmonary nodule or coin lesion. This lady is 63, no history of malignancy, has a left lung nodule and x-ray during a routine physical, suggestive of cancer. She was a smoker, a bad smoker, so clinically it was felt it was best that she undergo a thoracotomy. They did a wedge. Lephopolos sent to pathology separately to micro for routine bacterial, fungal, and microbacterial. Nothing grew after six weeks in micro. Histopathologically, however, the moment I looked at it, I said it's consistent with a particular entity within those granulomas. This was the x-ray. It was basically a subpolar lesion. And this was the pathology, cross-section H&E. The granulomas are showing at the edge all of these lymphocytes and a lot of fibrosis. When you go to the middle, you see caseation necrosis. In the middle of that, a large number of beautiful multinucleated giant cells. And in the midst of that, the telltale spherical walls broken up with nothing inside or a cluster of endospores that no longer have a spherical wall. Impression is a pathology consistent with an old coxidoidoma a fibrocaceous from calcific pulmonary lesion caused by the dimorphic fungus coccidioides imitis. As you now know, the dead or dying distorted organisms of these old lesions did not grow here and they seldom grow. So your pearl is not all that looks infectious, not, not all that looks like a pulmonary uh, neoplasm in a patient undergoing a cancer workup turns out to be cancer. It could be a manifestation of one of the deep fungal pathogens such as a 
histoplasmoma, blastomycoma, coxioidoma, paracoxy, or even a mycobacterioma. I'm going to cover these two as opposed to the all coxidoidomas meant for your boards in acute disease by coxy or most of the other dimorphics, those will yield cultures. But in these old lesions where things are dead or dying, they don't. And a clinical pearl solitary all coxidoidomas may require no pharmacologic treatment, resection, maybe the diagnostic and therapeutic approach of choice. Sometimes Dr. Green uh, still t uh, treats for a long time. This is break time. So we've covered today, in a nutshell, the deeper systemic subcutaneous superficial opportunists, every fungus you'll ever have to deal with clinically or I'll have to deal with pathologically or microbiologically with included in that table. And then there are things to remember, such as histo 2 to 4 microns thin neck, blasto 16 microns broad base, Coxis ferrules with endospores, 50 microns. The lookalike is rhino, 200 microns, mucicarmine positive, and paracoxy, mariner's wheel, remember? The sub Q ones are eumycotic mycetoma, serralisheria, actinomycotic mycetoma, actinomyces, nocardia, streptomyces, chromoblastomycosis, black moles with your sclerotic bodies, copper penis or medullar bodies, sportricosis, sportric shankii, the your little what they call them cigar bodies, and then lower mycosis and rhino, which we try not to cover. The third one was your uh, superficial ones, the candidas, the malassezia as a cause of tinea versicolor, and the other syndromes, the more important being fungemia in a young baby who's an IV into a lipid, and then the causes of the true tinnias, the dermatophytes. And then the last one are the most important one for those of us working those of you, everybody working with very, very sick people, cryptococcosis, high yellow, and fair hyphomycosis, and the zygomycetes fungi. And then we gave you pearls to remember. So, this part of pathology can help a lot when we don't have micro to come save the day. And now you know what to request of your pathologist. So, you know, be, be pushy. Go there and then, oh, are you seeing septated hyphae that bifurcated 45? <laughs> or are you seeing broad, hyposeptated ribbon like hyphae? and they'll commit themselves to you. Thank you so much.